The story goes of the young university graduate uh, who gets his very first job at a local engineering company. Uh, Monday morning, he arrives bright and cheery, uh, and he is directed to the workshop supervisor who hands him a broom. Somewhat indignantly, he says to the supervisor, uh, hang on, I'm a graduate. Uh, I've been at university for the last three years. I'm so sorry, said the supervisor. Here, let me show you how to use it. In the work we do, it is helpful to know what our role is. It is helpful to know what our job is. Uh, We've been working our way through Paul's second letter to Timothy. Uh, Paul is in prison in Rome. Uh, Timothy, a church leader in the very worldly city of Ephesus. And Timothy needs to know what his job is as a church leader. Uh, And actually, 2,000 years later, uh, I too need to know what the job of being a church leader is all about. I need to know what my job is so I don't get distracted and lose focus. You need to know what my job is so that you can encourage me, so that you can hold me to account, uh, so that you can gently tell me off when I get distracted from my job. Uh, What is Timothy's job to be? Well, you can see my first heading. You can see that I've taken it from verse 2. Preach the word. Verse 1, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Uh, We talked last week about God's priceless gift to us of the Bible. God has spoken. He has breathed out his words. He has caused humans to write these words down. He breathes his spirit into us And he enables us, as we read the words on the page together, to hear what he is saying to us. Uh, My grandparents on my uh, mother's side, uh, they weren't brought up in the potteries, they were brought up uh, near Worcester, uh, which itself um, has a, or had, a pottery industry. Uh, Their flagship brand was Royal Worcester. And I understand that when my parents, oh my, when my parents, when my grandparents got married, and this would have been between the two wars, when they got married, uh, many of their wedding presents were Royal Worcester China. But I understand they never used it. Uh, Talking to my mother, she says that it was kept in a cabinet in the front room and it was rarely used. Uh, Lovely china, not used, I think is a shame. But God's priceless word, not used. God's priceless word, not used for what it was intended. Well, that is, that's more than a shame, isn't it? How does God intend the Bible to be used? He intends it to be preached. Uh, The word preached, well, literally that word means heralded. So the town herald would proclaim, would announce, would speak out the words of the, the town council. God's herald 
is to proclaim, to announce, to speak out God's word. Timothy says the Apostle Paul, your people are in a world that has values diametrically opposed to the gospel. Timothy, your church does contain some influential people who are teaching a false gospel. Timothy, how are you going to keep your church going? What is the key to the survival of your church? What is the key to the growth and maturity of your church? Verse 2, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. In season and out of season. Uh, All the time, whether you feel like it or not, whether they feel like it or not. Keep at it, don't stop. Correct people, rebuke people, encourage people, urge them, exhort them, warn people. You need great patience. Don't get impatient, Timothy. Careful instruction. A couple of hours preparation in front of the telly on a Saturday night won't cut the mustard. Timothy. As an aside, if you ever want to gently challenge any gospel minister, ask them, do you fit your sermon and Bible teaching preparation around everything else? Or do you fit everything else around your careful preparation? And crucially, Timothy, what is it that you are to preach? With what are you to correct, rebuke, encourage? It is with the word. Don't preach what comes into your mind. Preach the word. Don't just give people happy, uplifting, inspirational thoughts. Preach the word. Don't preach popular psychology. Preach the word. Now, clearly, verse two is aimed fairly and squarely at Timothy, at future church leaders, uh, at me. But verse three speaks to us all. Uh, If verse two, the church leader is to preach, verse three, how are we all to respond to that preaching? We are to put up with that preaching. Verse three, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. My second heading, put up with the word. Now, at first sight, that doesn't sound terribly attractive, does it? Uh, If you, uh, one of your friends says to you, what's the preaching like in your church? Uh, And you say, well, we put up with it. (laughs) Generally, we put up with things we don't like. Uh, Us guys, uh, our wives put up with us leaving the loo seat up. Now, why that's an issue, I've never quite worked out. Uh, We put up with the English weather. We put up with the fact that as we get older, we aren't as energetic as we once were. So why do we need to put up with preachers who faithfully preach the word? Because if the word is faithfully preached, we will inevitably hear things we don't want to hear. Isn't that what verse 3 is saying? For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Timothy, if you teach the Bible, you will say things people don't want to hear. And some won't put up with it. But what will they do? Well, they will find someone less, well, less demanding, less provocative, less challenging. Verse four, less truthful. 
They will go and find someone who says that what they are doing or the way they think is just fine, really. Let's just ask ourselves the question. Let me ask myself the question. And I'm just looking at verse two. Do I like being corrected? Do I like being rebuked? Do I like being urged, encouraged to change my thinking, change my attitude, change my actions? Do I like being told I'm wrong? Well, you may, but I don't. I want people to tell me I'm right, not that I'm wrong. I like being told that I'm doing fine and I need to carry on doing the, way, doing the things the way I do them. I don't like being told that in this area or that area of my life, I'm going completely in the wrong direction. You can see the point, can't you? If God, through his word faithfully proclaimed by the preacher, is going to correct me, rebuke me, encourage me to change, tell me I've got it wrong, I'm not going to like it. That sort of preaching, the sort of preaching Paul is urging Timothy to do, I'm going to find uncomfortable. My temptation is to stop listening to that sort of teaching. Verse 5, my temptation is not to put up with sound doctrine. My temptation is to go and listen to people who will tell me what I want to hear. Verse 3, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. According to God, we are to put up with his word we are to endure his word because his word will say things about him that we don't like and we don't want to believe his word will say things about us that we don't like and we don't want to believe his word will say things about his ways that we don't like and we don't want to believe his word will say things that seem to us unfair And so what will we be tempted to do? We will be tempted to turn away from the teaching of the Bible and we will be tempted to make up our own Bible teaching. God does not want to send anyone to hell, we'll start saying. God does not cause anyone suffering. God understands my sin and he doesn't mind that much. I can do more or less what I want because God will forgive me anyway. I can put off committing my life wholeheartedly to Christ today because I can do that tomorrow. I can be a Christian without coming to church and engaging with Christians at church. God wants me to be wealthy and happy and successful. If I have enough faith, I will never be short of money. I'll never be ill. I'll never feel stressed. I'll never find the Christian life hard going. The God of the Old Testament is harsh and brutal, whereas Jesus is very gentle and won't hurt anyone. An adequate prayer life is me chatting to God just when I feel like it. And the list of myths is endless. No, we are, and I include myself in this, we are to put up with the word. We are to endure the word. What does that look like in practice? Well, almost certainly, I think the starting point is verse 16 of the previous chapter that we looked at last week. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So putting up or enduring in practice, I guess, means uh, at the beginning of every sermon I listen to, every Bible study I go to, Probably I will be praying that God would indeed give me ears to hear that I might be taught and trained and corrected and equipped. Uh, And when I hear things that I don't like, 
perhaps especially when I hear something I don't like. I recognise that that may well be a moment when God is particularly aiming to get my attention. He is at that moment maybe looking to shatter one of my myths about what being a follower of the Lord Jesus really means. Preach the word, put up with the word. Thirdly, be motivated by the word. What does motivate us in life? Uh, What do we get out of a bed in the morning for? Uh, Well, I guess it's been different things almost according to our stage in life. Uh, Maybe when we were younger, it was exams so that we could get to the college we wanted to get to or have the career we wanted. Uh, Maybe it was sport or boyfriends or girlfriends or relationships or, or leisure time. Maybe it was our career so we could climb the ladder or our job so we can pay the rent or pay the mortgage and provide for our family or building security for our retirement or or now maybe leaving a legacy for our children or our grandchildren. And it does, I think, get a little bit dismal as we think too much about these because the years just go faster than we like. And life never works out quite how we expect. And there always seems to be hardship, whether in the life of those we love or in our own lives. And on top of that, Paul is encouraging further hardship, isn't he? Why, we must ask, why would we want to listen to him? Why would we want to put ourselves under the authority of God's word if God is going to make us dissatisfied with ourselves? Why would preachers want to say things that will inevitably make them unpopular? Why would any of us want to listen to things that probably we don't want to hear? And then we think of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Knowing that he has not much time left, knowing that it was his preaching the word that landed him in prison awaiting execution in the first place. Timothy. Why should he go through the heartache of persevering with his preaching ministry? Why should he go through the pain of people rejecting him and his message? Why not go for the easy life of saying nice, bland things or promising, exciting things? Paul says to Timothy, verse 1, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. In view of his appearing. the royal family and their appearances, people flock to them, don't they? At the wedding of William and Kate, one million people turned out on the streets of London to get a glimpse of their appearing. And something like 24 million of us in the UK alone turned on our TVs to get a glimpse of them appearing because of the appearing of our future king and queen. The day the Apostle Paul is looking forward to is not the appearing of his earthly king, uh, the Emperor Nero. Uh, Clearly it wasn't the appearing of King William of England. No, it is the appearing of Christ Jesus, King Jesus. How was life for Paul in his last days as he looked forward to that day of his appearing? Uh, What would happen on the day that Paul saw Jesus face to face? He tells us. Verse 6, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, 
but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Uh, The boxer, the wrestler, in the closing seconds of the fight, uh, the bell is seconds away. The marathon runner on the final mile, uh, the finishing light is in sight. Exhaustion, (laughs) pain, single-mindedness. The single-mindedness needed to cross the line and to receive the winner's medal, the athlete's wreath, the athlete's crown. And the prize the Bible promises, the prize the Bible motivates us with, the prize for those who keep following the Lord Jesus until the very end, that is not the athlete's wreath or the athlete's crown or medal, it is... The crown of righteousness. One day, finally, I will see Jesus. Finally, I will be like Jesus, says the Apostle Paul. Finally, I will see the righteous judge. Finally, I I will be as righteous as the righteous judge. The new creation. The prize that Christ has won for all who put their trust in his death on the cross. We know the cross, we talk about it much. All my sin onto him, all his righteousness onto me. I will live forever in the spotlessly pure and breathtakingly wonderful new creation in the physical presence of Christ himself. As we know, Paul finished the race shortly after writing this letter. Paul expected Timothy to also finish the race. Paul expected future Timothys to finish the race. Paul expects you to finish the race. To preachers, Paul simply writes, keep preaching the word. To all of us, he writes, keep putting up with the word. And also to all of us, he writes, be motivated by the word.